Our scripture today comes from the first chapter of Luke. I put in the chat um, the whole verses 26 through 56. I'm only going to read 26 through 45, um, but I encourage you to read the whole um, narrative, including the Magnificat from Mary. Uh, we have a beautiful reflection on that from Tammy as today's Advent reflection. Um, so you can find that on our Facebook page as well. And I want to do offer a little bit of a content warning. Whenever we talk about Mary, her story is inherently tied to her um, role as mother of Jesus. And so if fertility or motherhood or any of that is a really hard topic for you and you need to not listen to this to go away for a bit, um, that is just fine. Uh, I am also always available to check in with um, after this if you need a place to process that as well. So Luke chapter one, starting at verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. As he came to her and said, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom, there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who is said to be barren for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, here am I the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is, is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Emmanuel, God with us. This is one of the names for Jesus that we proclaim, especially this time of year. It's a title that gets right to the miracle, the hope of this season, this wonder that God longs to be with us as much as we long to be with God, that God could not stand the distance between divinity and humanity any longer. So God became incarnate to bridge the gap. There is a deep desire on God's part to be with us as embodied in Jesus. But of course, Jesus doesn't come into the world of his own volition. He doesn't just pop out of nowhere. He was born of Mary, this young girl, who when an angel showed up and put this huge challenge in front of her, barely missed a beat. And of course, I have read this story of Mary a little differently than I have in years past, having a more intimate knowledge of the physical toll she is about to go through. And I marvel even more at her assuredness that this is something she can handle. 
Although I imagine, you know, now having gone through it, that on Christmas Eve, much like when Griffin was born, I all of a sudden didn't think I could do it. So maybe Mary had a moment on Christmas Eve where she didn't think she could do it. But in this moment where the angel arrives, she says yes. And I wonder if she has this sense that all will be well because she knows that she is not alone. Gabriel, the angel does not start out with, don't be afraid. They get there and yes, I think angels use neutral pronouns. But the first words out of Gabriel's mouth are not, don't be afraid, like literally every other angel in the Bible. But the first words are, greetings, favored one. God is with you. Before conception, before the plan is revealed, before everything else, God is with Mary. I think it's that assurance that God has and is with her that carries her through the act of hearing what is to come and then actually carrying it out. It's the promise that God is close that helps her understand what is required of her from bearing the Christ child to raising him to watching him die on a cross only to be risen again. Throughout all that, Mary knows that God is with her, walking beside her through the journey that she is on. The liturgical calendar celebrates this event of the Annunciation of Angel Gabriel appearing to Mary when um, on March 25th, right? And it's not rocket science how they got that. They just counted nine months back from Christmas. And of course, we know that Jesus probably was not actually born in December. So this event probably didn't actually happen in March. But it's a nice thought that somehow through all the patriarchal nonsense of the church, someone thought it would be good to officially mark the day in celebration of Mary. And as I was thinking about this story, that date struck me. March 25th. It seems like a million years ago. But we did have a March 25th of 2020 this year. As of March 25th, I went back and figured it out. We had already missed two in-person worships. We had only done one Zoom worship. We were in the middle of Lent, and I believe we had served the meal at the table in to-go containers in the parking lot twice. We had no idea what was to come. We were still perhaps hoping that we would be able to gather together to celebrate the resurrection of Easter. We all thought like, oh, wouldn't that be so nice? We go through this Lenten time and then we can be together for Easter. I don't believe any of us really imagined that it would be Christmas and still we are separated. It is painful, especially in this season to have gone so long without feeling the tangible presence of the community, to not give hugs or share meals or sing carols with more than just your household. My household includes Tim, who is a fine singer and Griffin, who does not know the songs yet. And that is, you know, not great. And nine months ago, we had no idea of the pain and the isolation and the grief that lay ahead. It was in that moment that Gabriel spoke. God is with you. Not just to Mary 2,000 years ago, but to us. March of 2020, as the world as we knew it was on the precipice of change, the promise of a God who was with us came in the words of an angel speaking to a girl who was about to change the world. And she knew she would survive whatever that change meant for her, the derision of being unwed and pregnant, the hard conversation she must have had with Joseph, the pain of childbirth generally, not to mention among the animals, and then the heartbreak of watching the son she bore and raised and loved be crucified. She knew she could endure because God was with her. Perhaps we have and will continue to endure what this year has thrown at us because God is with us.
Because what comes when God is with us is a deep love that changes us and walks with us even in the hard times. Maya Angelou puts it in this way in her poem, Touched by an Angel, which we'll read in full later. She says, love arrives and in its train comes ecstasies, old memories of pleasure, ancient histories of pain. Love does not erase pain, but rather holds it. God's presence with us does not ensure that everything will be easy, but rather that our pain and pleasure is held together in the hands of a God who loves us. And yes, we long for the day when the love and presence of God is augmented by the love and presence of loved ones in our community. This is why Mary then goes running to Elizabeth's house. Because even while she knows that God is with her, even as she is carrying Emmanuel, God with us in her own body, she needs the touch and the love of her friend and confidant. I'm gonna share the words from another favorite poet of mine who is not published because she's only four years old. But earlier this week, Margot Brownlee, everyone's favorite child, who I believe will either be a poet or some other thing that helps us see the world in a different way. But Margot said earlier this week, love feels like water in the tummy. I love this image. I really, I just, I seriously contemplated just saying that image and then meditating on it for 10 minutes altogether. Love feels like water in the tummy. Love is the feeling of satisfaction and nourishment that readies us to keep going. And we get that from any number of places and people, many of whom we are missing. Perhaps that's why this year feels so dry and parched. We don't have that same access to that water of love that we are used to. But that's why this year, more than most, we hold on to the promise from God this season. Emmanuel, God with us. God loving us and being as near to us as water in our tummies. God nourishing us through what has been and what will be through grief and isolation and exhaustion and pain so that we might come to a point where we know love and peace and joy and hope for a world redeemed by the ultimate sign of God's love, Jesus Emmanuel. Amen.